Well, I hope there ain't no riot down here. I, uh, there was, um, I mentioned this yesterday. I was going to, I was going to play the video. I couldn't, couldn't find my Twitter feed for it, but a sheriff down in a county in Florida, um, made a video and he said, yeah, we hear that some of those rioters plan on coming into our neighborhoods down here. Just want you to know that everybody down here is very well armed. And if you come into their neighborhoods, they will kill you. And he said, we don't mind. Amen. Uh, that's, that's the condition. I'll say this. That's the condition that liberals have brought this country to. Um, somebody, somebody, one of the commentators, one of the talking heads on the news, uh, I think it might have been, um, oh, who was Trump's attorney for the impeachment? The Jewish guy. You know, I'm talking about Harvard, Harvard liberal. But I don't know what he was doing representing Trump anyway. But he said Trump has basically forced the, the Democrat Party to the extreme left. Now, I don't know that Trump forced them there. I don't believe that. I think they had moved there and parked themselves there years ago. And uh, in order to become the party of all inclusiveness, you have, you have to keep up with the most extreme rhetoric that there is. And you have to embrace that and say, we embrace you, we love you, we are open arms to you, and, um, and, it, and it's been moving that way. The, the Democratic Party of your grandma and grandpa is not the same one that's there now. It doesn't exist anymore. And uh, this has been going on since the days of Jimmy Carter and beyond. Uh, Bill Clinton and Hillary made it worse, and it's just been getting worse ever since then. Meanwhile, the Republican Party has followed step with that and slid over to the middle and then to the left, not really representing the people who sent them there to straighten all this mess out. And uh, so it's gotten, it's gotten to the point in this country where something extreme, uh, I'm not going to say has to be done, I'm going to say it's going to be done. Um, whether it was the liberal Democrats that controlled the nation that took us to a bad place because that's where they were headed or it's someone who puts it to a grinding halt and has to use extreme force to stop it that's bound to happen or the American people just said we're tired of the whole bunch of you and um, you know we set a precedent back in 1776 when we wrote to King George and told him that whenever people were forced into tyranny, it was their, ra their right and responsibility to throw off such forms of government and establish new government. And um, so we, that's what we did 200 some odd years ago and it may come to that again. Um, I love my country. I love the land that I live in. I wouldn't want to live in anywhere else, uh, but I want to preserve the freedoms that we have for my grandchildren. And that's where my heart is. So, um, the salt to the earth seems to have lost its savor. And because of that, it's being trodden on the foot of men. That's what Jesus said. Take your Bible, turn to 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, if you would. We'll start out there tonight. I appreciate uh, you all being here, you folks online, we appreciate you and the folks in Kenya. We're glad to have you with us tonight, and we praise God and rejoice with you. We are studying the gospel, and that's where my heart is. Um, my heart is, uh, number one, where, wherever God's kingdom is, I was reminded of that today and just doing some reading out of the book of Isaiah, I love the kingdom of God, and it's for God's kingdom that we do what we do. 
for his, you hear me pray, for your glory and your honor's sake. Um, I learned that years ago. God will have mercy on who he'll have mercy, whatever brings him glory. Whatever brings him honor, what, whatever brings him worship and praise, that's where God's heart is. And if you line yourself up with that and put yourself as far as you not getting any glory, as far as God getting the glory, if, if everything that you seek after is for the glory of God, you won't have a problem having God answer your prayers. You won't. Because what you're wanting and what you seek after is in line with what God seeks after, what God, what honors and glorifies Him. And that's just something that I've found in life. Uh, so anyway, my heart is where the gospel can be preached. Uh, to be able to, to show people that they're sinners, that they need a Savior, that, they, that there is a Savior... And there's, I'm not one of these that's going to preach well that you can be found in any religion. There is one true religion and a bunch of false ones. And I hate every one of the false ones. I'm, I hate every false way. I don't like people lying. Uh, somebody sent me a um, website to look at this morning. And it was all a pack of lies. Every bit of it. And it was... One of these that supposedly was for things that we would be for. Uh, a guy was making claims that he was a sort of a second-hand man to Donald Trump, heading up Donald Trump's Pentagon pedophile protection program or whatever. And that didn't sound right to me. So I went and looked. There is no such program. Uh, and the guy made all that up because he had said that the government had discovered like 35,000 kids that had been stolen and were being trafficked. And he was making a claim that he was like partly responsible for the government finding that out. And I'm going, I don't believe that. And when you did a little research, you find the guy was basically is a fraud. And he's using that, that name, the... Pentagon pedophile something network. Um, he's using that to raise money for himself. I'm going, okay, I get who you are. It doesn't, it doesn't matter if it's right wing. It's still fake news. It's still a lie, you know. So let's stick with the truth. Let's stick with what we know. Amen. Uh, so we're going to learn the gospel. We talked about the gospel. We're going to talk about salvation. Uh, but let's look at... A uh, couple places in the Bible that deal with the actual punishment for rejecting the gospel. There is a punishment for those who reject the gospel. Uh, let's go to the Lord in prayer tonight and we'll get into scripture and then we'll have our prayer time. Appreciate you being with us tonight. Heavenly Father, we do ask for your guidance, your blessing. We thank you, God, for meeting with us, for bringing us through yet another day. We pray, dear God, Lord, that you'd bless all of those in our church. There's some sickness going around. We pray, dear God, that you'd bless each and every one of them. Father, I pray, Lord, that you'd bless and look over my family tonight. Lord, bless each and every one of my children. Lord, help them in their walk of life. Bless all of my grandchildren, all their families. I love them very much. And I pray, dear God, Lord, that you would protect them, watch over them tonight, give them healing. Give them blessing tonight. And uh, Father, I pray for our church. Pray, dear God, that you would continue to use us for your kingdom, for your glory. What brings honor to you is what we want to do. Father, we serve you and not the other way around. And Father, we're glad to be your servants. We're glad to be your children. We just pray, dear God, that no matter how great or small you choose to use us, Father, that you would use us. And Lord, we'll uh, celebrate and worship with you and your kingdom for all of eternity. We thank you, God, for being our God, for calling us to be your elect. We ask you, God, that you would open up our eyes and our ears tonight to Bible truths. Help us, dear God, to teach them wherever we go. Father, that people would come up to us and ask us of the hope that we have and why we're not dismayed and why we're not all doom and gloom. Father, we believe in your kingdom. We believe that Jesus is coming one of these days. And we look forward to that day. 
And we just pray, dear God, that you would prepare us and use us all the days of our life uh, in getting ready for that particular day. We love you and we ask you, Lord, to guide us as we study your word tonight. We pray in Jesus' name and all of God's people said. Second Thessalonians chapter 1, um, verse 7. Paul says, to you who are troubled, rest with us. When the Lord Jesus shall be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. That, talk about UFOs. That's going to be a sight. Amen. He's going to be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels. Uh, to me, that is a connection. If you are connecting things in your Bible uh, to, I believe, Matthew 24. In Matthew 24, he specifically mentions that immediately after the days of, of uh, or those days of that tribulation or, or something like that. Let me get it right here. Um, the tribulation of those days. That's what I was trying to say. Immediately after the tribulation of those days, verse 29, shall the sun be dark and the moon shall not give her light and the stars shall fall from heaven. The powers of the heaven shall be shaken and then shall appear the sign of the son of man in heaven. Then shall all the tribes of the earth mourn, and they shall see the Son of Man coming in clouds of heaven with power and great glory. And he shall send his angels with a great sound of a trumpet. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from one end of heaven to the other. And if you go back to uh, 2 Thessalonians 1, you see that. He said, when the Lord Jesus shall be revealed, verse 7, from heaven with his mighty angels. He's going to appear in heaven. He's going to be revealed and I think the Bible says that every eye shall see him uh, and they that pierced him. And he's going to send his angels out. They're going to gather together uh, all the elect in Christ, the dead first, then we which are alive and remain. So he says in verse eight, in flaming fire, taking and here it is, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel. Of our Lord Jesus Christ. That is, a, that is a heavy statement. Them that know not God. Now what's in that statement is. That number one. God can be known. A lot of people in religion say. That God is a mystery. And we cannot know God. And the Bible is inadequate. The words of the Bible. Words are inadequate to describe God. I've heard a lot of people say that. A man by the name of Neil Donald Walsh wrote a book called Conversations with God. I doubt that he had any. But he said that God spoke to him. He had conversations with God. And God told him that there was no religious book that really conveyed who he was, that words uh, are, uh, are sort of meaningless when it comes to describe God. Words are a poor way of describing who God is. Well, that's not what God said. God chose words. He chose the foolishness of preaching is what he did. Okay, so it means that God can be known. The best way to know God is to know his son. If you know his son, then you know, I mean, it's, I, as I get older, oh, I see more of Milton Hoggard in me just in little things that I do, I catch myself going, Mike, that's exactly how your dad did it. Oh, man. Okay. So, if you want to know, if you've never met my dad, you want to know him, get to know at least half of me because I'm him. But Jesus is fully God. You want to know who God is, get to know Jesus. How do you know Jesus? Read him. Read his word. So he says, uh, in flaming fire, take, taking vengeance on them that know not God and that obey not the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. And again, how do you obey the gospel? How do you obey it? You believe it. That is coming under obedience to it, is that you believe it. And when you believe it, you will respond to it. It's not a matter of you must do the works and it's a work salvation. It is a matter of if you truly believe it, you will act upon it. And anybody who says they believe it and yet their actions 
uh, denounce that, then they're not right with God. They're not saved. They're, he said, "You by their fruits ye shall know them. It's that simple. So there is a penalty for those who obey not the gospel of Jesus Christ. Verse 9, who shall be punished, and, I, and, and underline this statement, with everlasting destruction. Somebody tell me how you think that means. Everlasting destruction. Destruction. And I'll put it like this. As opposed to a one-time destruction. A one-time destruction would be like if you had a piece of paper and you threw it in the fireplace. In a few seconds, where is it? It's destroyed. It's like Hillary Clinton in a law office. Okay? Because that's... There's a story that goes all the way back to the 90s that she worked for the Rose Law Firm in Little Rock that was handling the Whitewater land scam where they were funneling millions of dollars through this bank on a real estate scam and she was the lawyer for this scam and she spent a lot of her time shredding documents because people were looking into the scandal. She's pretty good. And then when they were asking her, was there any documents left? And she said, no, she testified that there wasn't any documents left. Somebody found a whole stack of them in the White House that she hadn't shredded yet. So anyway, she's good at it. Anyway, um, let's see here. Where, where was I going with that? So, so somebody describe everlasting destruction. What do you think that what do you think that looks like? What do you think that is? Is it is it a one time poof and you're gone punishment from God where God burns you up and you're completely destroyed for all of eternity? What is it? Because and that's the purpose for the resurrection, the second resurrection. Remember, God is going to resurrect those who are doomed. You're going to give them a new body. Why? A body that is everlasting so that their punishment then is everlasting. Matthew 25, he says everlasting punishment. Here he says everlasting destruction. The two are interchangeable because it's not destroyed all at once. It is destroyed constantly. And I know we don't understand that, but that's how it's going to be. Okay? And so that's the punishment of it. Uh, who shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. When he shall come to be glorified in his saints, there it is. When he appears in the heavens with his mighty angels, he comes, verse 10, to be glorified in his saints and to be admired in all them that believe. Because our testimony among you was believed in that day. So he's including this idea that obedience to the gospel is believing the gospel. Because he says, and to be admired in all them that believe. What I can't do, I believe Christ has already done. Amen? And that's the gospel. So a punishment for those. Turn to uh, 1 Peter chapter 4. 1 Peter chapter 4. Verse 17, uh, First Peter is a wonderful, wonderful book, I believe, written to the church in advance of, I believe, a time of trial before our translation. That's what I believe. So in 1 Peter 4, verse 17, For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God. If you go back to Ezekiel chapter 8 and 9, well, Ezekiel chapter 9, when um, God is sending out the men with the swords to destroy all of the, all the abominations and all the wicked people in Jerusalem, he says, begin at the house of God. Start at the temple 
take care of those guys, then work your way out. For the time has come that judgment must begin at the house of God, and if it first begin at us, what shall the end be of them that obey not, there it is again, that obey not the gospel of God? And if the righteous scarcely be saved, where shall the ungodly and the sinner appear? Wherefore, let him that suffer according to the will of God commit the keeping of their souls to him in well-doing as unto a faithful creator. So very simply put, God's offer, in fact, there's another verse, I'm just thinking here off the top of my head, um, back in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, um, in verse 8, it says, Then shall that wicked be revealed, and the Lord shall consume with the spirit of his mouth, and shall destroy with the brightness of his coming, even him whose coming is after the working of Satan, with all power and signs and lying wonders, and with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish." Because they receive not the love of the truth, that they might be saved. And for this cause, God shall send them strong delusion, that they should believe a lie, that they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. And I think of men like Pastor Cooley and others uh, who go out and street preach, and they declare the gospel to people, and they give them the good news. They tell them that they can be saved, they can, they can be forgiven of all their sins. Of course, they're going usually to uh, things like uh, gay pride rallies and things like that. But they're preaching the gospel. And uh, they're hated. They're despised. You know, I didn't ask Pastor Cooley if he decided to go to his church Sunday. Because I figured that all the cops in his area would be busy up in the city. Yeah. Dealing with the rioters. Hey, that's the perfect time to go to church. Because then he could use the excuse, uh, they weren't social distancing when they were burning down the Starbucks. So anyway, uh, but anyway, here it plainly says that God offered them the truth, offered them his uh, token of love in the gospel, that he sent his only begotten son for them. He offers them this. They blatantly reject it. They refuse it. They spit in God's eye. They curse God. And so God says, fine, I'm going to send you strong delusion. You're going to believe a lie. And, and the reason is because you rejected the love. You had not the love of the truth. And so verse 12, that they all might be damned who believed not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. They, whenever you'd rather have sin than salvation, that's when you know you're not right with God. When you'd rather, when you choose sin over salvation and it's that simple so punishment for those rejecting uh the gospel now let's look at just the topic of salvation and what is it did i cover this already i seems like i i, I checked the last we weren't here last wednesday night so i checked the wednesday night before that and I checked what I taught just to make sure I wasn't covering it twice. And I don't think I have. But the issue of salvation. What is it that we're saved for or saved to or saved from? Um, if, if you were to go out and talk to the average lost person... You know, somebody may be in their 30s, 40s, 20s, something like that. There's a good chance that they may not have gone to church much, if at all, in their life. And you would talk to them then about salvation or being saved and ask them the question, are you saved? Have you ever been saved? We would think, well, they should know what that term means, but not anymore. This is post-Christianity America. Okay? People quit knowing those terms a long time ago, I think. Most, I would say most of the people that I went to high school with here in this town, uh, most of them, large majority of them, not Christians. Um, I, did a, I did actually a survey as part of a class, one of the classes I did. I kind of surveyed the students. I asked them about their religion. 
And there was a sort of a, a split between uh, those who were Catholic, and those who were Protestant, and a majority of the Protestant uh, students were Baptist. So we kind of had that going. Um, but an overwhelming majority, I would say, of the kids that I went to high school with, more than likely were never saved even though some of them had spent some time e either in a Catholic church or a Baptist church or some other church like that, they're not saved and, and probably never were. In fact, uh, the biggest Baptist church in this town, I'm not going to say which, um, I went to school with that pastor's daughters and one of them is an avowed lesbian and the other one is not a lesbian that I know of, but fine with her sister, the lesbian. And that also was true for his music director, his choir leader. Two of his daughters that I know of, or three actually, that I know of were lesbians. At, you find that out after high school. Okay, so, I mean, they talked about salvation and they may have, at one point, those kids may have gone to an altar somewhere and that church may have said, well, they're saved. Nothing they can do to lose their salvation. And yet, there they are. So if people are to ask, what is this salvation about? What, 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 are, they, what are they saved to? What are they saved from? What are they saved for? So the question, that's the question. Saved from what? John 3.16 tells us, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. So it's a choice between one of two eternal situations. You will either be in everlasting joy and everlasting life, or a state of, the verse we read a while ago said, everlasting destruction. But it is a conscious state of everlasting punishment and destruction. So that to me is, a, is an easy choice. Then, of course, the Catholic Church throws in the third option. Well, there's purgatory. If you don't like either of those two places, there is purgatory. You can choose to go there if you want. It's made up. John 3.36 says, He that believeth on the Son hath everlasting life. He that believeth not the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abideth on him. So he makes it clear now that salvation is there offered to them so that they can avoid the wrath of God. Avoiding the wrath of God is what being saved is. What are you saved from? The wrath of God. Romans 1.18, for the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now, when he says the wrath of God is revealed from heaven, uh, think about this. In just about every civilization on earth, there has always been a system for punishing those who break Community laws, tribal laws, uh, kingdom laws, civil laws, things like that. Throughout all of human history, from every city that's ever raised up and every tribal group that's ever lived, there's always been a system whereby you punish those who do wrong according to the rules of the tribe or the rules of the city or the rules of the kingdom or whatever it is. There's always a way to punish those. And in most cases, punishment was by death. So, to me, the wrath of God revealed from heaven, it makes it evident in that, as human beings, we didn't just evolve from animals with an, with an animalistic idea of what happens when people do wrong. When animals do wrong, who cares? In the animal kingdom, when an animal goes against whatever rules, who cares? But in human society, it's always been, there's always been some form of punishment for people that do wrong. Unless we let Antifa take over. Because I read this yesterday. Um, 
that one of their stated goals is to eliminate the criminal justice system out of this country, completely eradicate it, eliminate it, eliminate all prisons, get rid of all policemen and all military, tear it all down. So that now there is no such thing as wrong. There's only right. They seek to create, I guess, a dreamland utopia that will never exist. Never. Unless Christ is here. Never exist. But that's what their, that's what their stated goal is. To eliminate prisons, eliminate all policemen, get rid of them all, so that whatever you do is right. But what if I do it to somebody? Is it still right? What if they don't want me to do it to them? Is it still right? And how are you going to deal with that once it's done? They don't have an answer for that. This is thought out by college kids. Or people on drugs, one of the two, or both. But the wrath of God is displayed in the idea that in every society... In every, in every society, murder's been wrong. There's always been a form that if you kill another person, there's certain guidelines, I guess, but if you kill another, take another man's life, that's wrong. It's wrong in practically every society. If you take another man's wife or husband, that's wrong. If you steal another man's property, that's wrong. If you say something that's not true to somebody, that's wrong. We all have this in every society. There is this idea there's certain universal ideas are right and wrong. And they're based on the Ten Commandments. This is why the Ten Commandments is carved into the doors of the Supreme Court building. Where the Supreme Court is, Ten Commandments carved into that door. Because it was the basis for our laws and morals in this country. Stealing something is wrong. Killing somebody is wrong. Uh, and all that goes along with that. So if there is a God and he is a ruler over his creation, then he did establish rules for man to live by. And if man doesn't have any punishment for disobeying those rules, what's the purpose of the rules? What good does it do to have rules if you can't enforce them? By the way, St. Louis City, um, congratulations. Because all the people that got arrested by the police for looting and destroying property, your city prosecutor, Kim Gardner, set them all free. Turned them all loose. Yep. So what good... It's just like the county prosecutor, Wesley Bell. Who the day he stepped in, the day, the day he was sworn in office said, I'm not going to prosecute any more marijuana charges. So what he did was, he's now legalized marijuana in St. Louis County. Just de facto state exists where he legalized marijuana. Because it's not against the law if the law has no teeth and the law has no sword, then there is no such law. So now what Kim Gardner has done in releasing all of these people, she's in, a, in essence said, it's okay if you destroy this city. It's okay if you do. Because we won't prosecute you. If something ain't right. There's a spirit. Understand this. This is not just political. It's a spirit. That'd be a good PMO for tomorrow. Amen. <laughs> So saved from what? Romans 5, 9, much more than being now justified by his blood, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Saved from wrath. God's wrath. Um, think about the last seven things that God's going to do before Christ's kingdom comes on this earth. They are the seven vials of wrath poured out Unto all mankind. God's going to deal with man's wickedness. God's going to, he's not going to offer repentance anymore either. Ephesians 5 verse 6. Let no man deceive you with vain words. For because of these things cometh the wrath of God upon the children of disobedience. 
The wrath of God, look up that phrase, wrath of God, or just the word wrath. In your King James Bible, you'll see it. 1 Thessalonians 1.10, And to wait for his Son from heaven, whom he raised from the dead, even Jesus, which delivered us from the wrath to come. I preached Sunday about having charity among us and charity towards lost people. Don't you ever forget that lost people are in a state that every one of us used to be in before God saved us and that we deserved it, still deserve it, as much as they ever did. And if God can save us, he can save them as well. When God saved me, when God saved my brother-in-law, he made a believer out of me. When God saved each one of us, it ought to make us a believer that God can still save people. Don't forget to pray for lost people. Don't forget that this is, this is why we're doing this, why we have church, why we teach what we teach, why we're going through the Bible, learning these things, so that we ourselves can then share this with other people who need to be saved. Uh, they couldn't care less about some things that we put out on the internet, but they need the gospel, that's for sure. Psalm 917, very quickly, the wicked shall be turned into hell and all the nations that forget God. There it's plainly put that God is going to judge each and every man, woman and child in this world. Uh, take your Bible, turn to Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11. This is going to be the last judgment. I saw a great white throne. We call it the great white throne judgment. And him that sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away, and there was found no place for them. Um, verse 12, And I saw the dead, small and great, stand before God. And the books were opened. Another book was opened, which is the book of life. The books were opened. Thou, those books... I believe are the books of your deeds. Everything you do is written down. Everything, and this is something that I'll just throw in here. When the president uh, issued this executive order declaring Antifa a terrorist organization, let me kind of give you a little bit of what was set in motion. Number one, because they are a terrorist organization, certain rights that they would have under the Constitution, those rights don't apply. They're a terrorist organization. It means that all of the data that the NSA collects, and they collect everything from everybody, Okay? And I mean everything. Especially in this digital world, I guarantee you there's a pipeline that goes through the NSA building and they collect it. Every website, every text, every email, everything. So what happens then is them being designated terrorist organization means that that data, that, that it's illegal to use that data on an American citizen. Okay? It's illegal. We have a right to be secure in our effects and papers. Okay? In our person and effects. But if you're labeled a terrorist, then that data can be used against you. So these idiots, with their phone in their pocket going into a building to light it on fire at a protest? Guess who knows they went in there? The NSA does. And then all the money that got funneled to Antifa from various organizations, including 
political organizations, including politicians, like Joe Biden's campaign fund, all of that money is traced, and whoever donated, you just donated to a terrorist organization, is what that means, okay? So all this collection of data that government's been doing, there are restraints to it, unless you're a terrorist. And if you're a terrorist, the, all bets are off, okay? It's gonna be used against you. Now with God, just picture angels up there watching over you, writing everything down. I saw that, yeah, I saw that. Oh, I know what you thought, writing that down. And when you stand before God, everything's gonna be read out. Everything that you did, and that's what those books are. Um, verse 12 again, all those books were open. Another book, which was the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things which were written in the books according to their works. And see, this is, the, this is the difference. These people are judged according to their works. Why? They can't be judged by their faith because they didn't have any. There's nothing left to judge them by but their works. And that's what's written in the books. And the sea gave up the dead which were in it, and death and hell delivered up the dead which were in them, and they were judged every man according to their works. And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And in verse 15, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. And that lake burns forever and forever and forever. So that's what people are saved from. Now, uh, let's start on this tonight, and we'll continue it next Wednesday night. The application of salvation. Is salvation ever a temporary promise? Is salvation something that God just gives out, but then he retracts it at his will? Does a person merely pray and believe but for a moment and then thus they are now saved and secure forever no matter what they do or does that person have to abide in that same gospel and abide in that covenant as long as they sojourn here on this earth i believe to me it's very plain when Jesus spoke of the vine and the branches, he made it very clear that if a vine or a branch does not bear fruit, it is cut off and cast asunder and it's withered. Men gather it up and they cast it into the fire. Any branch that does not bear the fruit that God means to uh, produce in it that branch is cut off and I have in my lifetime I've seen numbers of people people that as a child as a boy growing up I thought hey these are the godly men these are godly women I can count on them not in church and not coming back either not gonna it's not gonna happen they abandoned, they walked away, they quit believing, they got back into sin. They just rejected it, plain and simple. I could tell you stories tonight, but I'm not going to. Psalm 78, verse 9. The children of Ephraim being armed and carrying bows turned back in the day of battle. What direction did they turn? Back. They kept not the covenant of God, refused to walk in his law, and forgot his works and his wonders that he had shewed them. Second Chronicles chapter 34, verse 21. Go inquire of the Lord for me and for them that are left in Israel and in Judah concerning the words of the book that is found. For great is the wrath of the Lord that is poured out upon us because our fathers have kept not the word of the Lord to do after all that is written in this book. And he he's basically says it, that since salvation is linked with our belief in God's word, those who reject God's word, doesn't matter when they did it, 
Those who reject God's word are therefore rejected from being qualified for salvation. They're rejected. They rejected God's word. God rejected them. And the best example that I've ever found in the scriptures is King Saul. And we might look at him next Wednesday night. But Saul clearly rejected what God said. He rejected God's commands. He rejected his statutes. He rejected the word of the Lord that came from Samuel to him. He tossed it aside, did what he wanted to do. When he was confronted about it, he lied about it. So I did do what God said. Samuel said, no, you didn't. The fact that you're arguing with me and not apologizing tells me something. And that seems to be the case with a lot of people. They'll argue it, but never apologize. And um, so anyway, we'll look at that next Wednesday night.